Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to start things off. Uh, it'll be a bit of a tyrant as far as schedule goes uh, with regard to today's event, which is uh, Location Meets Social Networking, a Wireless Policy and Practices Dialogue. This event is hosted by the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, which is a group of about 200 organizations, um, public interest organizations, nonprofits, think tanks, trade associations, and corporations that work to try to address um, certain policy issues and, and present the issues in a fair and balanced manner. And we've put together an incredibly diverse panel and set of panels for today's discussions. We have a few presentations, a few panels, and at the end, we're going to finish it off with a discussion of uh, best practices and, and responsible implementations. Um, this particular topic has outgrown out of years and years of work within the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee to look at pressing issues uh, related to personal safety, uh, child safety, and uh, location privacy. Back in 2001, we held a, a briefing in Congress on location privacy, followed that up last year with a more uh, nuanced discussion of uh, location information and privacy. And during that time, we realized there was a tremendous amount going on in this space. Um, factor in the issues related to social networking, and we thought it was time to get together and, and have experts in the field talk about where this all is going, what the technology is, how we see it playing out, and the responsible ways we can implement some of this technology. What we don't want to do is all of a sudden get to a, a, a point where the technology is implemented and we haven't built in the safeguards so everybody's very comfortable with the technology and, and we're implementing it very responsibly. So we've, we've put together a, a variety of different experts from uh, privacy advocates, civil libertarians, technologists, uh, corporations, trade associations, child advocacy groups, and we've developed this program that hopefully will get us ahead of the issue, uh, understand it a little bit better, and form a platform for ongoing discussions. I want to thank uh, DLA Piper and Looped for providing the coffee and, and, and the projector and, uh, and the amenities that will make this a, a more uh, a comfortable experience. Um, what, happen, what will happen today, we'll start off with a presentation from, by Larry Magid uh, and Ann Collier. Uh, well, Larry Magid, who is partners with Ann Collier and Connect Safely, Dot com, which is a, a, a website where parents and, and, and families can network with one another and learn about how to connect safely, so to speak. Um, they are pretty much the intellectual driving force uh, behind this particular discussion, and we've been working with them for uh, over a year kind of thinking through these issues, and that's the culmination, uh, and this is the culmination of that discussion. So uh, we're going to start off with Larry Maggot, who's going to go over the technological underpinnings of the technology. We're going to go into this particular this great panel to talk about the issues and implications. And a quick coffee break, again, thanks to DLA Piper and, and uh, uh, Looped. Um, then we go into a presentation on the issues related to law enforcement access to that data. Uh, by Mr. Fourth Amendment Jim Dempsey of the Center for Democracy and Technology. Then we'll go into a, a, a panel looking at the technological underpinnings of the network and how it all works and how uh, user preferences can be uh, expressed uh, using location information. And then finally we'll have an open dialogue at the very end at about 11 o'clock looking at um, ideas for responsible implementation and best practices. And, and I think what we'll have an opportunity to do is look at some current implementations and then imagine future implementations on, in using different technology and how, how best um, to, to implement these, these, these services. Um, so without further ado, um, let me introduce uh, Larry Magid. Uh, he's the co-director of ConnectSafely.com. Uh, he's the founder of SafeKids.com. Um, he also uh, is a, a, a journalist for CBS uh, uh, News. Um, and Larry has received in the past um, uh, numerous accolades and awards for his work with regard to kids' safety online. Um, he even has a Smithsonian Medal uh, for his work. So uh, let me introduce uh, Larry Maggot, who's going to give a quick presentation. Larry? Good morning. Well, I'm going to go over some technologies, and if it's a little bit mind-numbing, I apologize. It is not normally my style to give PowerPoints, uh, but because we're dealing with specific technologies, I thought for today only I would do that. But if you fall asleep or remain asleep throughout the thing, all you have to know is that if you have one of these, which is a Blackberry, 
or even one of these, which is the free phone that I got when I signed up for Sprint, you probably have some kind of location finder in your phone, whether it's GPS or something else, or GPS in combination with something else, so that you know where you are. But because it's also a phone, and therefore a radio, and therefore able to transmit, someone or something else also knows where you are. And we'll talk a little bit why, in a minute, moment, why that's the case. But the fact is that if you take away nothing else from today, realize that as you walk around, and I'm sure all of you are carrying one of these, uh, you are not alone. So what we're talking about today is location-based services, um, which have been around for a number of years, and they're growing at a reasonably rapid rate. Um, it started out with emergency 911, so that when you call 911 from your phone, your location is known. Uh, as you know, when you call 911 from a landline, uh, the authorities know where you are, and this has saved many lives because sometimes people make these calls and they're not able to say where they are or who they are. Sometimes they are simply able to dial 911 and that's it. Now that cell phones have become so, so popular and many homes don't even have landlines. My, my children are examples. My a son lives at UCLA with uh, four roommates and instead of Verizon getting $20 to share among uh, four users, uh, Verizon and Sprint and Singular and others are sharing hundreds of dollars among the four uh, tenants of that apartment. Uh, so it's certainly good for that industry, but it means that when I call my son, I have no idea where he is, and if he were ever to have to make an emergency call from his apartment, uh, he would have to rely on E911. But there's more, navigation. Telenav is an, is an example of a company that uh, allows you to find yourself through your cell phone. And this happened to me a few weeks ago. I was in a cab from uh, Alexandria off to uh, Reston, Virginia, and the cab driver didn't know how to find where I was going, nor did I. And on my phone, I was able to bring up a GPS system, track where we were, and get us to where we wanted to be uh, through my cell phone using a service that costs a few dollars a month. We've all heard of OnStar, uh, and they're more than happy to brag about all the lives they've saved, but indeed, OnStar is using location finder GPS combined with a cell phone. Child finders, very common, uh, uh, although not that popular yet, but the notion is you give your kid a cell phone and you're able to track them. Uh, advertising and search, I'm sure we're gonna talk about later in the day. Uh, traffic applications I already mentioned. Uh, fleet tracking, big business for fleet tracking, tracking assets. This kind of technology makes a lot of sense if you're a police dispatcher and you need to know where your officers are, or if you run a trucking firm and you need to know where your trucks are. Obviously, if you have location finding technology, uh, it enables you to avoid the call, car 54, where are you? Um, and then we're gonna talk about social mapping today, uh, and I'll leave that up to the folks at Looped and others to talk about self-guided tours. And then a new one, and you'll see a little picture in the lower right-hand corner. It's kind of hard to make out, but that little device that that person's holding in their hand is designed for elderly patients who might wander off from their nursing home or their assisted living center, uh, maybe with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia, and that's tracking them. So obviously, a potentially life-saving technology. Uh, it's hard to estimate the size of this or many other markets, but I did speak with David Williams, who uh, is one of the consulting uh, uh, firms in the marketing area, and he estimates that, that it's roughly about $750 million today in the U.S. and Canada, and he thinks that that's probably a very conservative estimate. He also estimates that it's going to grow by 75 to 100 percent over the next two years. And these, by the way, are including all forms of uh, location-based except for RFID, which I'll talk about later, radio frequency ID. So why? We talked earlier about why they have the capability, and it's all based on federal mandates. Uh, the FCC has a two-phase program that it's uh, rolling out nationwide. Uh, phase one requires that they be able to pinpoint your location within a certain period, uh, range, and we'll talk a little bit later about what that is and how they do it. And phase two is that they find you within 50 to 300 meters. Um, I found out that my local uh, service didn't have it in August when I fell down on my bike and broke my elbow and had to call 911 for my cell phone and I had to figure out where I was because they didn't know. So it's not quite there yet, at least in my community, but ultimately it will be. Now, this is what I want to talk about, the technologies. You've all heard of GPS. Many of you probably have a GPS receiver in your car. And the way GPS works is that above us right now, there are 24 satellites circling the Earth, and each one is in a known location in, in, in orbit. 
and each one is transmitting 24-7 their location down to Earth that your receiver is picking up on. And so by doing some math, estimating, for example, how long it takes for the signal to reach you, when the satellites transmit the signal, they're time stamped. So the satellite knows when the signal was sent. Your receiver knows when the signal was sent. Your receiver also knows when it was received. And even though we're talking about tens of fractions of seconds, I mean a tiny, tiny amount of time, that's enough time for the receiver to calculate the actual position of the satellites. So if it's talking to enough satellites, uh, typically four is a good fix. If it's able to position the various satellites over, over you, it can determine your location within a couple of meters. And if you've, any of you have ever used GPS in a car, you'll know that it is surprisingly accurate as long as you have a line of sight positioned to the satellite. So if you're uh, in a dense forest, if you're under, on a, under a tunnel, or in an urban environment where, where the line of sight is blocked, you might not get that signal. But if you're out in the clear, chances are you know where you are. But because most GPS units are standalone and they're not connected to a phone system, you and only you know where you are with a typical GPS. And that brings us to a GPS. So I mentioned earlier that GPS is great if you're in the clear. But if you're not in the clear, then your GPS needs a little bit of an assist. And that gets to a GPS or assisted, I mistyped that, it shouldn't be assistant, assisted global positioning system. And a, an assisted global positioning system communicates with an assistant server. And so, for example, the GPS in this phone, this is a little cell phone, again, you get them for free when you sign up for service. Yes, it has a processor. Yes, it has a battery. Yes, it has a memory. But a very weak one at all of that. You don't want to waste your entire battery in five minutes trying to do the calculations to figure out where you are. And you certainly can't, for a phone that they give away for free, have such a sophisticated processor that it can do that math in very quick real time. So the way the people who built this phone get around that is that when I do a GPS fix and all the calculations and all of the math that's involved in that, I'm working with a server which is somewhere on the network, somewhere my cellular carrier or the individual businesses that work with them, in this case it's Telenav, have servers that are doing all the math, that are you know, churning up all the electrical power that needs to do it, and they are sending the data back down uh, to my phone. Now, in addition to telling me where I am, because I'm talking to a server, and this is where it gets interesting, they can send additional data. So for example, on this little phone, which has a very tiny amount of memory, I have the map of all of North America. In fact, I don't know, perhaps the map of the world. I'm not sure how extensive this data is. And you might ask, how can you fit the map of the world or North America on the tiny memory of all of this phone? And the reason is, it's not on this phone. It's being sent down on demand from the network. So if I were to do a fix on myself now, I would get a map of Washington, D.C. Uh, if I had did it yesterday, I was in Los Angeles, I would have had a map of Los Angeles because the network knows where I am. But what's interesting, because it, it's a network, it also knows other things. So the example I like, like to use is that Telenav knows gas prices in the areas where I happen to be driving. So if I'm looking for the cheapest gas within five miles, it'll find it. And clearly that information isn't living outer space in a satellite, it is living on a server somewhere being transmitted to my phone. So Lots of very exciting possibilities. Traffic information is another. Uh, the GPS that I have in my car knows what road I'm on, but it doesn't know road conditions. But as soon as it starts talking to a server, which is analyzing traffic data, instead of simply telling me I'm on 101 and yes, you could take uh, Bayshore Highway if you want, it might say, you're on 101, which is about to become a traffic jam. I recommend Bayshore Highway. So that's the technologies that are being rolled out as we speak. Now, how it works, and again, I'm not going to get too much into the, into the technology of it. It's, it's a process called triangulation, and the techies call it triadulation, tri, trilateration. For all practical purposes, it means the same thing. You can argue about the differences in the terms. But the bottom line is that if you have more than one reference point, uh, it can help find you. And I'll give you a, an example. Um, when you are, for example, using uh, position relative to cell towers, uh, you might be, let's say, in Washington, D.C. And oh, I, I'm skipping ahead of myself one moment. Um, I mentioned AGPS, and I mentioned the fact that we have more than a satellite system. So while we have a satellite system which works in the clear, if you're in a building, if you're in an urban area, there is an assist, and these assists come from cell towers. So we are all, if we have a phone that's turned on and, and is connected, we are all in communication with at least one cell tower. And that is in a fixed location. And the cellular network and others know exactly where that is. 
and your phone has a fix to that. Even if you have a weak signal, even if you're not able to make phone calls, there's a pretty good chance you're able to ping that tower, that that tower and you have had some kind of communication. And an example of this is, I think it was James Wong, who was a reporter from CNET, who sadly did die when his, uh, he and his family were uh, stranded in, in uh, Oregon uh, earlier in the year. His family was rescued because at one point a, his phone pinged a tower. And with that, they were able to get a rough, approximate idea, at least relatively where they were, and that led to the rescue. So there is that notion that even if you're not in touch with a satellite, you're in touch with at least one, um, one cell tower. And um, the technology is able to determine where you are based on how many towers you are. So for example, here in Washington, if I'm in touch with one tower, chances are, because we're in an urban area, that cell phone antenna is probably within a mile or two of me. So basically, if, God forbid, I were in distress and all we knew was the fact that I, who my, my, my phone was, authorities could say, okay, Larry is somewhere in this rough area. We don't know where he is, but at least we know he's here, and that's good because it means they're not going to be looking for me in Palo Alto where I live or in Bethesda or anywhere else. They know something about my location. That's because the one tower is basically putting out a signal which says, okay, he's somewhere here. If I'm able to touch with two towers, and this is where triangulation works, there becomes an overlapping set of radiuses. And what we know from the two towers is that I am somewhere in that middle sphere uh, where these two circles overlap, that I have to be right there. And that's a lot better than before. We, we've pinpointed my location to a reasonable area, and certainly if this were uh, an open area, uh, authorities could probably search and locate me. Now, if you can get three or more towers, then it gets very interesting. As the three towers triangulate, and that's the try and triangulate, you're able to pinpoint the uh, location almost to an exact position. And I remember back years ago when I was a pilot, I used to use triangulation uh, to find myself if I were ever lost because it was the same technology. Triangulation has been around for a long, long time. And so in this case, you would actually be able to pinpoint me probably to this hotel, certainly to this block. Now, regardless of the technology today, you would not be able to tell what ballroom I'm in. So if you're law enforcement and you want to bust somebody in a big uh, office complex, chances are it's not going to help you find that person, at least not their suite. It might tell you the block they're on, it might tell you the building they're in, but it's not going to tell you the room you're in. So that actually from the emergency system, from the E911 system, leaves a challenge because you may not actually be able to find it. So keep your landlines handy, especially if you live in an apartment complex. Um, again, there's a lot of different, what uh, Sam Altman, who's the founder of Loop, uh, Mark Jacobson, he quoted, gave me this quote, there's a lot of what they call, he calls fancy mass triangulation off of cell towers. And two of the more common ones are the uplink time difference of arrival and the advanced forward link. And uplink time difference of arrival is similar to what I talked about earlier. Just like the satellites are time stamping their messages and your receiver is time stamping them and able to calculate exactly the same thing happens with cell towers. So a cell tower puts out a message which says that I sent this message at, you know, 901.23 seconds and your phone received it at 901.24 seconds and it gets that off of three different towers. It's able to, to calculate that data and tell you your location. Again, that's probably happening on a server somewhere else, but your phone is delivering the information. Uh, and again, very similar technology uh, and it doesn't matter that we remember it, but the fancy mass, which uses the uh, AFT or the advanced forward link triangulation, where uh, you have multiple uh, phone systems that, that project your, your actual position. A new technology, which is actually gaining a reasonable amount of traction, is Wi-Fi positioning systems. And I don't know if we have anybody here from Skyhook Wireless, but yes, we do. That's a company, I believe in Boston, where they have people driving the country mapping all of the uh, Wi-Fi hotspots, both public and private, encrypted and unencrypted. Now, when I first heard about this, I got a little creeped out. I said, do you mean to say somebody has driven in front of my suburban house in Palo Alto and noted the fact that I have a Wi-Fi tower and, or a Wi-Fi signal in my house and is somehow going to impede on my privacy? But I have been assured by the people that all they are noting is the fact that there is a Wi-Fi signal at this location they are not attempting to break into the signal, and in fact, it's irrelevant uh, that it's encrypted because all they need to know is that there is a signal located at this address, and they're able to pinpoint any time anybody is in touch with that signal, they know that that person is within 
a reasonable distance, probably uh, several hundred feet from that address. And by using a similar technology uh, to what we talked about with cell phone towers, and really uh, when it comes to the concept, similar technology to GPS, they are able to triangulate multiple uh, Wi-Fi hotspots to know where you are. So uh, this technology is very interesting. And this chart is from Skyhook Wireless, and I'm going to leave it up to them to prove that it's true because I didn't go out and do the math, but it makes absolute sense that where you're in a, when you're in a, a rural area, when you're in an open area, that GPS or assisted <laughs> GPS is going to be a lot more effective because obviously as you drive uh, the Ventura Highway between Oxnard and, uh, and Santa Barbara at 70 miles an hour, you're not going to be in touch with that many Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, and certainly when you get out in the total boonies, you know, in the middle of Iowa, chances are that unless they're putting them on cows, and it wouldn't surprise me if they are, uh, you're not going to be in touch with too many Wi-Fi hotspots. So in that environment, satellites or other forms of technology are much better. But if you're roaming the canyons of New York City or Washington, D.C. or San Francisco, you're probably going to be in touch with thousands of, ho of hotspots, perhaps per minute. Uh, certainly in San Francisco, uh, you know, you, you can basically everywhere, they're out there. So the technology makes some sense. So it, what it means is we have yet another way of tracking where we're located. So uh, it just either if it makes you happy or if it makes you paranoid, either way, it's important to note that, that they're out there knowing where you are. Um, the, the interesting thing about, about Skyhook is that it has applications for a lot of things. I'm particularly interested in the AIM, uh, uh, the AOL Instant Messenger application, because AIM, AIM is used extensively by young people and older people as well. And I know we're going to talk about this in the panel later, but what this means is that somebody who's using AIM with their Wi-Fi equipped system, basically if you have a Wi-Fi card in your computer, it is able to transmit and receive uh, a signal from a Wi-Fi hotspot, so it's able to get a fix on your location, if not exact approximate. So just having, you don't have to be using it, you could be hardwired to an Ethernet ter terminal, but just having a Wi-Fi card means that your computer is getting a fix to a location, you're on AIM, and so I send Ann a note, say, hey Ann, how you doing? And if we're both uh, signed up for this uh, service with the plug-in, and it's free, by the way, Ann could know where I am. So. Perhaps I'm at home in Palo Alto, perhaps I'm at a hotel in Washington, uh, my location is evident. So if I didn't want Ann to know where I was, and of course I would never hide that from Ann, uh, then I would want to turn off the service, and of course you can. Uh, prior to the AIM deal, there was another company called Metro, still is, that uses a very similar service. So we're going to see a lot of independent companies using a lot of these technologies, whether it's GPS, AGPS, triangulation, cell phones, Wi-Fi, and, and other technologies for a lot of interesting uh, techniques. Now, Another one which I'm fascinated by is geotagging, again, using very similar technology. So you have a digital camera that has some kind of a radio in it. It could be a Wi-Fi, it could be a cellular connection, and the digital camera knows where you are. So if you take a picture, it actually tags the picture. Uh, as you post a note, for example, so that's, that's done by this uh, service called iFi. Another service called Socialite uh, lets you geotag sticky notes with your friends uh, from your cell phone. So as you send your friends a note, similar, I guess, to, uh, to uh, text messaging or perhaps uh, other, other services that we'll talk about, that note has location information with it. Um, and then, of course, there's self-reporting. A dodgeball from Google is a very early social mapping service where instead of relying on the technology, it relies on the person to say where they are. And Twitter, which is a phenomenal uh, development going on right now. It's something that I kind of understand, although I can't imagine using it, but I'm sure lots of people do, where you sit around and you tell people exactly what you're doing at any minute. I'm in line at Starbucks. Uh, I'm waiting for a ticket. I'm at the, the ball game and Barry Bonds just hit a home run. And you can type these out on your, on your text messaging and it's very popular, especially for those people who can type 100 words a minute on a telephone keypad. <laughs> I'm not one of them. Uh, but it would not surprise me if Twitter wound up doing a deal with Skyhook or Looped or Helio or anyone else uh, in this room where their technology automatically uh, geotagged your location, uh, identified you, so you didn't even have to say, I'm standing in line at Starbucks. You didn't say, buying coffee, and they'd know exactly which coffee shop you were, you were, you were in. Um, there are some short distance technologies which are used to track assets in the case of RFID. There's been some talk um, that this could uh, develop into a uh, geotagging or location-based system. We're not seeing a lot of evidence about the, out there right now, 
but certainly RFID is a technology that we need to be aware exists. And also Bluetooth. Uh, I'm not sure where it stands, but Ericsson, a number of years ago, uh, developed something called Bluetooth Local Information Infotainment Point, uh, where the idea is you have a Bluetooth-enabled phone, you're walking down the street, and you're walking by a pizza parlor that wants to get your business. They put out a, a coupon that says, come on in for a free slice of pizza or 50% off using the Bluetooth technology to, to do that. Now, uh, that certainly would work if you're close enough to the pizza parlor, but you'd have to be awfully close. And there's really no need to use Bluetooth because all of the other technology that I talked about would do exactly the same thing. And certainly, n they would know that you're relatively close to that pizza parlor. Now, this slide is really the transition into the panel. Uh, to simply point out that I have deliberately uh, not touched on all of the issues that location-based services bring up. And believe me, there are many. But I do want to sort of kick off the panel by reminding us that technology is neutral, that I don't care whether it's a kitchen knife that you use to cut your food and that somebody abuses to commit a crime with, uh, or a fixed-based mobile social network, a uh, fixed-based social networking service like MySpace or Facebook or instant messaging or anything else the technology is not inherently good, nor is it inherently bad. It is simply useful. And the real question is not um, how useful, but how it's used. And for that, I'm sure my colleagues will, will have a lot more to say.